<lacht> ich sehe, Sie fassen die ganze Sache von der humoristischen Seite auf. Was? Sing mit mir, sing mit mir, sing, sing, sing. No, nein, es Glücklich ist, wer vergisst, was nicht mehr zu ändern ist. Glücklich ist, wer vergisst, was nicht zu ändern ist. Sing with me, drink with me. Hello there, my mostly self-isolated friends, and welcome to The High Note, our monthly live stream featuring updates, interviews, and more from Opera Orlando. Whoa, wow, wow, what an audience, what an audience. Thank you, thank you. I'm your host, Gabriel Pricer, broadcasting live from the intimate setting of my dining room. Yes, I am still in my dining room. I just can't get out of this place. It's kind of like Thomas Adez, Exterminating Angel. Anybody get that reference? Okay, let me know. We have a lot of big news to share with you all today, so you want to have that rewind button ready to go. I don't know if they have a rewind button on Facebook, but we'll find out. We also have three, well really four, special guests joining us today, so let's get to it. Breaking news. This is your official COVID-19 company update. Typically, Opera Orlando would present our summer concert series, Opera on Park, at the intimate setting of the University Club of Winter Park in August and September. But due to the ongoing pandemic, we felt it was in the best interest of our audience's health and safety, as well as our singer's health and safety, to transition the concert series to a virtual platform and presentations. You will still be able to experience wonderful artists in perhaps an even more intimate setting than before, your own home in your own pajamas or whatever you want to wear. The artists will record from their hometowns and we kick off with the husband-wife duo of tenor Nathan Graner and soprano Jamie Chamberlain from Los Angeles on August 23rd. Then bass baritone Greg Baker, accompanied by Robin Stamper on August 30th, and to close out the series, another husband-wife duo, tenor Carlos Enrique Santelli and mezzo Ashley Dixon, who both won the Metropolitan Opera National Council competition two seasons ago. They will be accompanied in Atlanta by Clinton Smith on September 6th. All three concerts will be broadcast right here from our Facebook page, Sundays at 2 p.m. And now here's the really exciting part. There is no admission cost to watch these wonderful artists. I know, I can't believe it. Pretty crazy and pretty generous. Well, we are hoping that you are feeling generous as well, as we are asking for a suggested donation of $30 per concert or $75 for the entire series, which is what we normally charge for tickets to Opera on Park. As a registered 501c3 nonprofit, which Opera Orlando is, your donation will be tax deductible. And the real benefit is, if you make a donation of $75 or more, you'll receive special access to our virtual 5th anniversary party. Mind blown. I'm overwhelmed. I just, I don't know what to say. This is all just way too exciting. Let me back up. Originally, our 5th anniversary party was going to be on October 9th at the Alphonse Den. But again... We wanted to make sure we could all stay safe while we celebrate our first five years as Opera Orlando. So we have moved the party online and we've moved it up to September 20th at 2 p.m. We will be broadcasting live from one of our beloved venues, Casa Feliz in Winter Park, with a stellar quartet of singers. Here are those singers now. Greg Baker will be coming back. Laura Leon, you might remember her as the four heroines in Tales of Hoffman. Robin Rockline will be joining us. And tenor David Margulis, who you saw as Ernesto and Don Pasquale way back in the old days of Opera Orlando, like, you know, three years ago. And Robin Stamper will be joining us on the piano. A silent auction, surprise guests, and maybe even some virtual champagne. Wow, that's... That's like a river of champagne. That's a lot of champagne. Well, all of that excitement and musical entertainment for only a $75 donation. Wow, so what a deal. I sincerely hope that all of you can join us. Hey, you know what? $75 is just a suggestion. If you want to give more, 
more power to you. We won't complain. I know I'm excited and I hope you are too. Go to our website to learn more about Operon Park and our fifth anniversary party. I even hear that Arthur's Catering will bring some party food over to your house if you really want to live it up. Now that covers our COVID-19 update, as it were, for now. But as you all know, over the past month, our nation has seen some disheartening acts of violence and racism. And now more than ever, I feel it is important to make it clear that Opera Orlando does not condone any acts of violence. We do not condone acts of racism or marginalization of any kind. And we will meet and condemn such acts with the unifying power of our music and an acceptance for all. As an arts organization, we have a unique opportunity to share stories with you and provide a stage for all voices. Representation truly matters in the arts for all groups, and at this time we feel it is important to be there for our friends, colleagues, fellow singers and artists of the African American community. To continue to share their stories with the hope of bringing greater understanding, harmony, and unity to all of us. To tell us more about how we at Opera Orlando hope to do this, I'd like to welcome a fellow baritone to the program who sometimes moonlights as a tenor, as a conductor, as a social change advocate, as so many things. Oh, and not to forget, he is one of our wonderful, devoted board members at Opera Orlando. Please help me welcome to the program Chevalier Lovett. Whoa, Chev, they love you here. <laughs> how are you, Chev? Good to see you. Great to see you as well, Gabe. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great, Chev. Thank you so much for joining us. You know, these can be tumultuous times, and I think it's important for us to have conversations, candid conversations, and provide a platform for especially our artists in the African American community to share their stories. So we're launching this initiative called Representation Matters, a series and campaign to highlight those stories from the diverse artists, staff, and volunteers that make up our larger opera community. I'd love to know kind of uh, how you uh, jumped on board with this initiative and what your feelings are during this time. Absolutely. First, I, I want to say uh, in this time of COVID, I'm at home in my home office, just like everyone else. I'm trying to uh, stay self-isolated. Um, and, you know, I don't have anyone around me, so that's kind of nice. Um, <laughs> Good for you. So representation for me absolutely matters, particularly in the arts. So I, I just want to quickly bring folks up to speed on, you know, why I decided to join Opera Orlando and, and what the company has done for representation. As you can see, this pin here, um, is in representation of Pulse, where I myself unfortunately lost five friends, and we as a world lost 49 angels. Well, that was actually the first time I was introduced to Opera Orlando um, and their board. Um, and Opera Orlando at that time stood up for representation of folks in the LGBTQ plus community by doing a series of, of concerts uh, every single year after um, called One Voice Orlando, where we got a lot of folks together from across the nation to come up, stand against injustice, stand, stand firm and in solidarity with our marginalized communities. And from there, I knew that Opera Orlando was serious about how to truly stand with the communities that are often hurting and left behind. Particularly this, this year, 2020, has been very, very difficult in the black community. Um, as a black artist myself, um, I would not have been in this art form if I did not see someone that looked like me on stage. Um, as a classical musician, it's important to see folks that look like you and to know that you can do it. For example, um, Leontine Price, uh, Marian Anderson actually uh, opened up the gateway for several folks um, that, that are in the black community. Right? Um, we have some local gyms, Curtis Ram, who did the same thing. And so it, it's, it's important for people to know and see, one, diversity is beauty, right? Um, having a diverse mindset, having a diverse culture, having diverse programming. Um, you know, I don't want to listen to one opera the entire time. And I also just don't want to see the same people on stage the entire time as well. Um, now, I know, Gabe. You know, as a fellow baritone who moonlights as a tenor, I've heard you sing Nessun Dorma a couple of times. Um, uh, you know, folks folks don't want to, uh, you know, just hear us beautiful baritones sing. We got to spread the love, Chef. We got to spread right? the love. 
That's right. So it's still just what I hear, a, a beautiful baritone singing the entire time. And they're not just, just as much as representation and the voice matters, representation with the look matters as well. Um, and how we truly want to build, you know, social equity within our country and within the uh, artist platform. Right. Right. And we've been so grateful, uh, so honored to have some amazing African-American artists on our stage in the past. Um, one I'll mention right now, Brittany Robinson, is part of uh, this committee uh, with this new series about representation matter in the Black Artist Series. We have a little graphic that I want to share uh, for this series. And then, uh, yeah, special shout out to Brittany. Thank you for joining us on the committee, Brittany. And also Nathan Graner. Uh, who our audience will see as Don Jose and Carmen this season. He's also joined uh, the committee. We have their headshots up there that we're showing. Um, yeah, we really want this to not be about Opera Orlando. This isn't about, you know, what we've done or even what we're doing, but it's about our community, Chev. Um, I think you, you hit the nail on the head. Opera Orlando needs to be part of the community, and our community wants to see themselves up on the stage. Our community in Orlando is so diverse so diverse. So when we have opportunities to do works like The Secret River that's about an African-American family in Central Florida, it just seems to make sense that we should be the company uh, to take that on and have some in intent or um, have intentional purpose in, in casting African-American artists. Really, there's not a lot of repertoire out there, unfortunately, for African-Americans in opera. So specifically, commissioning The Secret River seemed like a unique opportunity for the company. Well, it was the right opportunity for the company as well, right? Um, one of the things that I want to touch on, um, so one, love Brittany, one of her biggest fans. <laughs> we love Brittany. Um, hey, Brittany, hope you're watching. What a, yeah. <laughs> she, what, what, a, what a brilliant countess uh, she was for us, right, um, in, in our last production of Leonardo Di Figaro. Um, but, you know, a, a part of, and you're absolutely right, this is, this is broader, this is bigger than Opera Orlando. But what I do want to say, though, is that someone has to take the first initial step. And that's not always easy for folks to do. Right. And so I commend Opera Orlando for taking that step. Um, again, as someone who's very local, where arts and opera is important to me, and being a black artist and a part of this community, um, you know, and being able, and just, just being asked to, to host this and to set, this is history, and to set a standard and to show folks why it's important to have representation. And you have no idea how many lives you're going to change just through this one series, right? Um, so we're, we're creating history here together and with all the guests that we're gonna have on the show as well. That is that is the hope, to, to make a difference. There's no question about that. And I don't think either of us claim to have all the answers. I don't think anybody claims to have all the answers. Uh, but there is hope. I, all of us have that hope for a better future. We can acknowledge the past, uh, but educate ourselves and prepare ourselves uh, for a better future in the arts and as a community. Right. If I knew all the answers, I wouldn't work. Uh, you know, I've worked for years in the social justice realm um, and have tried to use every platform to ensure that we're thinking through something equitable. Um, and if I did have all the answers, it would all be fixed. And, yeah. um, but what I'm, what I'm willing to do, um, and, you know, in our Central Florida community um, and throughout the nation, what we're seeing is we're seeing people are willing to partner to have these crucial, intense conversations, but to also make a difference and to set a framework and to make accountable standards for us to move forward um, as a folk, as a people, right, as a country. Right, all of us together, uh, that, that is the goal. So the, the Black Artist Series, uh, we should probably tell people a little bit more about what it is exactly, right? It'll pri primarily be on social media, uh, on our Facebook, hoping to uh, start up in July, uh, featuring singers, uh, featuring costume designers, uh, backstage people as well, you know, not just what you see on the stage, but also what happens behind the stage, featuring these wonderful artists, these wonderful members of our community, uh, who are African American and, and talk about their journey in the arts. And it might lead to profound conversations, it might not, uh, but we want to give them a platform to share with us as an audience. It always leads to uh, intentional, crucial conversations. And I think what's most important, right, is the story to share someone's experience of how they got into this. Like you said, we have some artists lined up, we have some folks 
everyone's an artist uh, if you're if you're a part of opera, if you're a part of the arts community. And so we have some wonderful folks lined up and just to hear their stories and think through shared experiences because that's what really connects with these people. Exactly. I'm not sure if you can hear the lawnmower outside of my house. The yard guys picked the perfect time to come by today, <laughs> Chef. Sorry about that. There's one like outside of mine, too, so it might be me. There you go. <laughs> That's the world we now live in, where we don't know whose lawnmower it is in our own yard. Um, well, Chef, any kind of last little thought here to share with people about this series? Maybe what, what are you most excited about or, or most hopeful about with this series? Well, one, I am, again, honored and humbled to be um, asked to help lead through this. Um, I'm excited just to sit down with artists, um, ones that I've known for years, some that I've not met yet before and, and will be introduced to, um, to share, uplift their stories, and again, create a historic moment um, in in this, this world we're in today as to why representation matters, why the arts um, has a crucial voice in what we're doing. Right. Um, and, and, and particularly, I, I just want to uplift talent um, and, and show that their talent comes in many different forms. It really is a pivotal time, and, and we are so grateful to you, Chef, to our other board members, to all the members of this committee that we're putting together um, for your commitment to this cause. And, and we just hope that these conversations can be helpful and shape a better future for all of us. Absolutely. Well, we have a lot of events coming up, Chev. I hope to see you uh, online at Opera on Park. And yep. Wait, our... Gabe, Gabe. Yeah, um, what's that? I, I actually see something behind you. Can you tell the, me what that is? Behind me? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, you mean this uh, like large gold thing right here yeah, what, next what to me? What is that? Oh, I, you know, this came in the mail the other day. It, oh, it looks like it's a Grammy Award, Chev. Oh, a Grammy? Wait, 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 wait a minute. I, I knew you were like fantastic and oh boy. wonderful. But like, what, what, what did you get a Grammy for? Well, it says on here that I won a Grammy for being a principal soloist for the best opera recording in 2019. Tobias Picker's Fantastic Mr. Fox. How about that, Chef? How oh, about wow. that? Wow, congratulations, yeah. Dave. It's very bold. <laughs> well, <laughs> it just happened to be here, so I figured, you know, might as well put it on display, right? Well, can you tell us a little bit more about Fantastic Mr. Fox? I played the role of Farmer Bean in Fantastic Mr. Fox. Uh, it was recorded by Boston Modern Orchestra Project. Actually, it took a long time for the recording to be released, but we're happy it finally was. Uh, Gil Rose was the conductor. Music by Tobias Picker. It's, it's kind of um, complex, but lots of fun. Very playful music, um, you know, based on the Raoul Dahl book, Fantastic Mr. Fox. Well, so Gabe, folks know, you know, as I serve on the board, I like to, I like to do a lot of challenges, and so I actually yeah. would like to challenge you to do a concert with the music of Fantastic Mr. Fox. You you think you can Oof. accept that challenge? Oof, I I mean, we recorded that like four or five years ago, so I'll really have to dust it off. No excuses, but, um, Gabe. No excuses. I, I want you to really think about well, it and do it. And we we have a very busy fall, as you know. We have a concert basically every weekend, August 23rd, 30th, September 6th, September 20th. There is a weekend off we have there, September 13th. Maybe I could squeeze it in on the 13th. Lucky 13, right? I think actually that's, I think we should actually put it on the books. Fair enough. I accept your challenge, Chev. I'll put on a concert. We'll do some music from Fantastic Mr. Fox. Will you come host it for me though? You know what? I'll be there. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. Call it good. Call it good, my friend. Well, in all seriousness, thank you, Chev, so much for joining us today. It's absolutely a pleasure. Um, I love being a part of this. I love what we're creating together. Um, and I'm looking forward to creating more moments with this, with the Opera Orlando. Be safe, my, my friend. Stay healthy as well. All right? I'll do my best. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear it for Chevalier. Love it. Thank you, Chev. Well, once again, we want to thank Chev and everybody involved in the Black Artist Series. These can be troubling times, as we mentioned, but I personally sincerely hope that conversations such as these and the ones we will hear from our Black Artist Series can provide some much needed healing and renewed or fresh understanding. Speaking of fresh understanding, our next guests on the program today have had their hands full with a little bundle of joy 
named Danny, and yet in their spare time they took on producing a virtual concert, which they will be sharing with us today. Please help me welcome to the program Operlando's, one of Operlando's favorite sopranos, Bridget Gann, and her husband, baritone Scott Johnson. Hey, Bridget. Hey, Scott. How are you guys? Thanks for having us. Danny says hi, too. <laughs> oh, and do you have the baby there with you? He is oh, here yeah. with us. He just recently woke up from a nap. We never oh. know what he's going to be doing. So but... he might, uh, you might hear a little concert <laughs> from him today, too. I woke him up, didn't I? I'm so sorry, Danny. <laughs> One, if I remember correctly, six months old. Is that right? Yeah, six oh. months old this week. Wow. Just this past week? Yeah. So well. he... He is growing up so fast. We were just saying that this has been a strange but amazing time to have a baby right in the middle of, you know, a, I, of a pandemic. I time cannot imagine. Well, couldn't have gone faster, if that makes sense. Absolutely. <laughs> but it looks yeah, so like, yeah. Adjusting routine life and adjusting to being parents. And, you know, so it's been great to have projects like this concert that we were able to put together. Um, and uh, also, we are, we've been doing work around the house and we've been actually expanding our studio so if any viewers out there are looking for voice lessons you can check us out at www.johnsonvoicestudio.com so there you go we can do it virtually now that's great well look, seems like you guys are keeping yourselves very busy good for you that's wonderful and remind me where where is home base where are you guys at today oh. Home is actually uh, Ewing, New Jersey, so um, All right. pretty close to Princeton. Yeah, we're about halfway in between New York and Philadelphia. Well, be safe up there. I know that was close to the New York epicenter, the New Jersey epicenter, so I hope you guys are staying safe. Absolutely. Yeah, it looks like they're, you know, they're on track to things slowing down, and that's what we, we want to continue to happen if people can, you know, take the proper precautions where those that's right wear those masks wear those masks um it's not going to hurt you now now bridget you were really an opera orlando pioneer starring in our first production as opera orlando a double bill of the impresario and Le mamel we have a couple images uh from that production do you remember that bridget that was a long time ago that was fun. oh very fond memories we so got much fun. you we got a picture of you as the uh, newspaper lady there and then as the diva in the impresario, I think your name was uh, Bethany Squeals. Was that your stage name? Squeals, yes. <laughs> you know, not that that's stereotypical of Sopranos at all. I think that name was a little a little harsh, really. What, what, what were some of your favorite memories of that production, Bridget? Well, you can tell just from the <laughs> how that name came to be. It was such a fun production, right? The, the way the script was updated, um, the whole the whole production was updated to be modern. So um, I just had a blast going back and forth with all these dueling high notes. I also remember that it was the highest note I'd ever sang in public, a high F. Yeah. <laughs> we three days straight and every day leading up to that. Um, but because we had so much fun with the production and the concept, uh, it kind of kind of happened and it worked out. Yeah, so I had a blast. it was our, our boisterous rebirth as Opera Orlando, boisterous beginning for the company. Right. And I remember the production in many ways was auto mockumentary, um, yes. self mockumentary of the company trying to get ourselves started. It was lots of fun. And then we had you back as Musetta. We have some images there as the temptress Musetta. And I'm so sorry you had to play opposite of that goofball baritone. He just right, seems who to was be. That guy? I don't oh, know. Right. Yeah, you're Marcello, <laughs> just rough, rough guy, rough guy. We have a lot. You know that that was a very fun production in all seriousness, and a sold out run. Four performances, all sold out, um, and obviously kind of a more scaled back version of Bohem with only 16 players in the orchestra and the intimate space of the Pew Theater. What what was that experience like to have Bohem kind of on a smaller scale? I mean, it made the energy in the space was palpable. I mean, it's that way with that opera in general because the music is so beautiful and it relates. So many people relate to that opera right off the bat because of the music. Yeah. But I, a lot is well, in fact, due to Bob, our director. Mm -hmm. um, he really kept the action moving and the interactions between everybody very relatable. You know, he, along with the whole cast, which I feel like we were all pretty committed storytellers. But it really helped to keep um, the the story. Uh, 
feel like it was something that people in the audience could relate to. Um, yeah. We felt like real people. And when I was in the Cafe Mamoose, you know, <laughs> throwing my little diva fit, it really felt like the, the audience was there with us. Was, they they was, totally were. Fun. Yeah. I mean, really, Bohem is an intimate story uh, just because it's performed in Absolutely. large venues, uh, kind of the bigger houses as well. The story itself is very intimate about a group of friends trying to figure out life. And I remember every, uh, I don't want to give away the story, but spoiler alert, Mimi does die at the end. Um, and at that moment, every performance, you could really hear, hear a pin drop in the audience. There was a real moment of silence there, um, which was moving. And then Scott, you were able to join us for our gala a couple years back, honoring uh, Kathy and Steve Miller. I, I should mention our prayers and thoughts are with Steve and Kathy. For those that might not know, Steve uh, was in the hospital. Yeah, he's back home now. Pretty regularly, or we, we try and, and text back and forth when we can. And um, I love her so much, and I always call her my opera mom. She's been there and supported my, my career um, for a very long time now. So she's been in my thoughts for her whole family, her and Steve. They're big supporters of, of the company. And Kathy was who introduced me to you, Bridget. So, yeah, she takes full responsibility for that. And our thoughts, our thoughts are with them. We hope Steve recovers uh, quickly. But we do have some images, an image there of Scott singing at the gala. Now, Scott, this question's for you. Do you guys get asked to sing together a lot? I mean, I imagine so. Soprano, baritone? Uh, yeah, I mean, actually, I mean, that's how we met 10 years ago at Central City. Uh, we were playing opposite each other in Orcs in the Underworld, if you saw our opera inspires, but... Uh, <laughs> right, right. Um, but yeah, and actually, that's sort of where the genesis of these, this concert series come, came from, is that we were looking for projects that we could do together, uh, and we were getting some requests from, from local organizations, fundraisers, that sort of thing, and we just always wanted to sing together. So it's sort of become this big series. We, we do a sort of an annual holiday concert we've done, uh, for local businesses, some galas, um, oh, arts organizations, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and actually, the concert that we're going to show uh, part of today uh, was originally supposed to be done in, uh, in person. It was supposed to be a live concert for, at a number of venues, uh, yeah. but then parking happened. And so we sort of had to adapt, and thankfully our accompanist was able to come and work with us, and we had a space nearby that was uh, basically empty, and we had a good working relationship with, uh, and they allowed us to perform. Uh, and so it was really... Uh, sort of fortuitous that we were able to, in this time, just find a way to make music and, and put it out. And we did create it uh, several weeks ago, actually, right right in the midst of when COVID was beginning, right? So right. Um, that was the prevalent theme of this repertoire, you know, whether you're feeling isolated, vulnerable, scared, there's hope, right? No one is alone, and you'll understand yeah. why when you watch the program. But I, we still really think that it's beyond the fact that COVID, everything else that's happening, right, um, <laughs> with Black Lives Matter, it's really important to know that um, the arts are here to lift us up and give us hope. They always unify us, and that message is still extremely important, right? And um, we want to do everything we can to educate him, educate ourselves, but still put out music into the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, music has that universal power. It touches all of our souls, and we're very grateful for you guys sharing this concert with us today and good on you guys to be so uh, adaptable and adaptive in, in your thinking. So many of our plans have changed as artists. I mean, it's kind of a scary time uh, to be an artist right now. Um, some of the major houses are canceling their seasons. Extremely yeah. adaptable, just like you've been with this, this series. Yeah, we try and roll with the punches. We try and roll with the punches and uh, just wait and see what happens. We take it one day at a time. Well, we want to open it up for um, some Q&A with our Facebook audience. Let's see if we have any questions there. I'm going to check on the, the old Facebook app here. They should pay me for all the free advertising I do for them. <laughs> Let's see. We have a question. Is that a real Grammy? Yes, it is a real Grammy, Mom. Stop asking. That is just inappropriate. She, I'm sorry. She's just so inappropriate. Uh, we have a question. Does your baby sing? Does little Danny okay, sing? So Scott said on Mother's Day, he keeps telling this story, Mother's Day, Daniel found his voice. Yeah, that was his present <laughs> to us and to his mommy was that he learned how to scream. Oh, yeah. So he, <laughs> see, he has a wide variety of, uh, of vocal sounds and timbres. And yeah. He loves to utilize them at some of the most inappropriate times. But that's okay. He's sleeping well. No, he loves... He loves when we sing. He loves honestly. music. He loves when we sing. So we, we actually will. Yeah. I'll play the piano and we'll we'll um, 
we'll sing little music theater songs to yeah. try and get him back to the house. We have a blast. Yeah, yeah. Well, I keep saying that we hope he grows up to play the piano. Yes. We have a full uh, ensemble right at, right at Then home. you can tour on the road, take your show on the road. I know in the um, Opera Inspires video that you guys posted with the Orpheus in the Underworld duet, I was impressed at him just being right next to you guys, fully resonating. Here's Bridget singing like high cues and uh, buzzing, buzzing right in his ear. And he was just having the time of his life. He was loving it. He was loving it. I think it's a big part of it because, I mean, actually... On his due date, the day she went into labor, we sang two performances of the Messiah that morning. That morning, four hours before I went into labor. Well, the Messiah will put anyone into labor. Let's be honest. The Messiah has that power. I think that's a... There you go. There you go. Um, now, so, somebody is asking, um, when will when will Bridget and Scott be back to Opera Orlando? Now, that's, that's a question for me. we got to find a time to have you guys back here. Me. Let yeah, us know. We do. We'd love to. We really do. We really do. One more question here. Um, this is somebody, a question for, for both of you. How do you guys balance being parents, you know, your work life, your home life, and being able to put on these concerts? It, that must be a tricky thing to keep yeah. your voice up and manage the, the babysitting, all that stuff. How do you find yeah. that balance? It's been a very unique challenge, especially during this time with COVID. I will say that because we're so isolated. We are 50-50 partners, which I I give him so much credit for all of the help, right? So when he's working, I'm helping with the baby, vice versa, right? A lot of times, believe it or not, honestly, I'm practicing with Danny because he loves it right now. Yeah. Still on that <laughs> I can see that he does. Yeah. My kids were the same way. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a, it's a balancing act um, and a lot of support, trust between the two of us. And honestly, right now, it's a real gift because uh, music has been um, oh, real yeah. music has been a real joy for us. It's been a real release to be able to share that with each other to right. kind of help things out, right? So much, so much baby time, and sure. um, it's actually kept us more sane. If that makes sense, why? That's why I was saying that. We need the arts more than ever now. Even yeah. if it feels like, well, that's that's the last thing we really need to focus on. I actually think the opposite. So that's that's how it's kept us going up here and here. That's great. Helps give us purpose uh, during these uh, kind of nebulous, unclear times for sure. Well, right. well, stick with us, guys. We're just going to run through our announcements of what's coming up online in the arts this week. This evening, Donizetti's L'Elysir d'Amore, or The Elixir of Love, is being streamed by the Metropolitan Opera for free, starring Kathleen Battle, a little tenor, a little known tenor named Luciano Pavarotti. Have you guys heard of him? Do you guys know Pavarotti? <laughs> yeah. Conducted by James Levine. There will be a prelude talk at 6.30 p.m. from San Diego Opera, hosted by Nick Revela. So make sure you tune in both to the prelude talk and the, and the stream, and that is free to watch Elixir of Love. What a wonderful opportunity from the Metropolitan Opera. Tomorrow, the Met will be streaming Cendrillon, starring Joyce DiDonato, and on Sunday, Mozart's Die Zauberflöte with Catherine Lewick. Our friends over at Phantasmagoria continue their weekly streams on Sundays at 8 p.m., featuring fire dancing and more. I know, very scary. The Orlando Philharmonic continues their soundbite series, the Timoco Arts Foundation has a streaming concert tonight at 7.30 p.m. and this Sunday at 7.30 p.m. And our friends at the Orlando Ballet Company and School are posting live training sessions for all ages called Be Moved. I'm moved. Are you moved? I'm moved. A little reminder that season tickets for the 2020-21 Opera on the Main Stage series at Dr. Phillips Center are on sale now. Save up to $20 on all three productions, Deflator Mouse, Hansel and Gretel, and Carmen. There we go. Now, to close us out today, we are going to let Scott and Bridget send us off with some beautiful singing. Some opera, some music theater. And again, a big thank you to them for joining us. Scott and Bridget, any kind of final words or uh, before we cut over to the concert, let's duet. Well, we're, we're just so excited to share this with you guys. Um, this is an abridged version of the full concert that we did, and we already told you about the premise, right? We really hope you enjoy the repertoire. It's it's really special to us. We've been singing a lot of these songs, duet solos, um, together in concert, and uh, we just, they really touched us during this time, and I really hope that it gives you guys, you know, this belief that we will get through this together this time, and we need to continue to lift each other up 
and use these arts to unify us all, right? That's, that's, that's what we really believe. We want to have hope for better days. And he's our hope. He's yeah. our hope for the future. And he makes a special guest appearance. So, yeah. Opera Orlando, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me to escape. Thank you, guys. I know we're all going to enjoy it. I love Danny's send-off as well. He's like, don't forget about me, Mom. Don't forget to talk about me. <laughs> well, everybody, without further ado, let's hear Let's Duet with Bridget and Scott. Here we go. from one of Mozart's most popular, well-known, and uh, favorite operas for a lot of people, uh, The Magic Flute. It was also his last opera, uh, where pa and in that scene, Papageno, who's this sort of quirky bird catcher uh, sidekick throughout the whole show, um, he sort of gets the short end of the stick throughout the whole show. Um, he finally meets his perfect match in Papageno, and you know, there's no way he is letting her go. And so Scott and I can relate to that sentiment just a bit. We actually met 10 years ago this month at Central City Opera in Colorado. We played opposite each other in two different productions. And since that time, we have traveled the country, traveled the world 
as opera singers. Our relationship has mostly, for the first half, been long distance until we decided to settle down in New Jersey. And we just recently welcomed uh, our, the birth of our baby boy, Daniel Thomas. I doubt Rodgers and Hammerstein could have ever predicted the current state of our world, but the lyrics of this next piece are hauntingly relevant and more important for us to remember now more than ever that we're not alone. circus who has been in town for for a while and uh, although she has a very jealous husband she has started a tryst a passionate affair with Silvio who I'll be singing and in this Bridget will be singing about uh, a certain song called Stridano Lassu which she'll tell you more about and then we'll go into uh, a plea from Silvio uh, to Nedda asking her to stay with him to run away with him and you know let love win and it's a, it's a really wonderful piece, and that's actually really special because uh, the first part of it is essentially an aria for Silvio, and it's the first piece that Bridget ever heard me sing back 10 years ago now. Nedda is one of the most beloved soprano roles of all time, but her story is very heartbreaking to me. You know, at the core, she's a broken young woman and a victim of domestic abuse, and my heart goes out to anyone who is struggling and feels that they're a victim of circumstance especially during this, this time. Thank you. 
Leonard Bernstein once said, our reply to violence will be to make music more intensely, more beautifully, and more devotedly than ever before. And of course, as musicians, we have always agreed with that sentiment, but now more than ever. We couldn't present a program today without his most stirring anthem. Thank you. 
and many of us have become quite introspective, quite closed off. In fact, many of us in the field of music making have felt extremely sad and not sure where to and how to proceed when collaboration is such a huge part of how we communicate. Scott and I are so blessed that we have each other to make music in our home, to share it with our son. But we want you to remember that even though right now you feel isolated, you feel scared, you feel unsure, you're not alone. together. It was actually in the same space, and I was nine months along pregnant with this little guy. His name is Daniel, and on that concert, we sang Oh Danny Boy. Well, we'd like to sing it for you and him today. Thank you. 
Thank you for joining us today and join us again next month on July 31st for the next episode of The High Note. Stay safe, hang in there, and see you online at the opera. <laughs>